All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for the second installment of our three-part panel discussion series, Return to the James Castle House. My name is Kristen Hill, and I am the Cultural Sites Program Manager at the James Castle House in Boise, Idaho, which is located which is on ancestral on and unceded territory of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Northern Paiute people. I'm joined by Brooke Burton, who will be moderating for tonight's panel discussion, and former James Castle House residents A.H. Gerard Avant, Rachel Rickert, and Tanya Alvarez. Providing ASL interpretation are Sierra McIver and Stevana Corder. Thank you all for being here with us for this event. Uh, tonight's event will run until about 7.15 Mountain Time, which includes a brief question and answer period. So please add your questions to the Q&A box at any time, and we will get to as many as we can during the last 10 to 15 minutes. In addition, this event is being recorded and will be made available online in the coming days. Along with ASL interpretation, English language captions are available by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and then selecting show subtitle. For those of you unfamiliar with the James Castle House, we are a cultural site and museum managed by the Boise City Department of Arts and History. Arts and History offers many other services to our community, including public art, history programs, archives, cultural grants, and care and conservation. I want to thank the City of Boise for its ongoing support and for remaining committed to our work at the Arts and History Department. Today, the James Castle House celebrates the life and work of Idaho artist James Castle through exhibitions, community programs, research, residency programs, and conservation of the historic spaces where Castle lived and worked for over four decades. As a deaf man and a self-taught artist, James Castle was afforded the rare opportunity to focus on a daily art-making practice while he lived with his family. His unique experimentation and investigation of his environment provide us with an unparalleled story of 20th century American life and culture. The Return to the James Castle House panel series is a program in conjunction with the James Castle House's current exhibition, Interlude, a five-year residency retrospective. This exhibition pairs contemporary artworks by James Castle residents with original artworks by James Castle, inviting us to explore the dialogue between artists, past and present. It is a beautiful show, and we hope you will consider visiting us in Boise between now and April 2024 to experience it in person. Uh, so thank you again for joining us virtually and for your continued support of the arts and cultural community. And I am now pleased to pass the mic to Brooke and our incredible former James Castle House residents. Hey everybody, I'm so excited that you're here and um, sharing my passion for digging deep into what makes artists tick, how they take in the world and their surroundings and their relationships and then translate into that, into creative expression. My favorite thing is to ask the questions, and I was lucky enough to get to sit down with each of these artists for an hour and pick their brain, and you'll get to ask some questions too. But we're going to just start off by letting each artist introduce themselves, where they're at, what they worked on at the James Castle House, and what they're working on now. So we'll start with Rachel. Thanks, Brooke. I'm happy to be here, guys. Um, my name is Rachel Rickert. I live in Joshua Tree, California. Uh, but before this, I was in New York City for 10 years. And I'm originally from Bethesda, Maryland. Um, when I was at the James Castle House, I was focusing on paintings and sort of two different series. One about the experience of being there, kind of in isolation, removed from my life. What was it like to be alone, making self-reflective paintings about my own habits and routines as I was kind of removed from my real life and able to analyze them. And then the other part of the work I was making there was responding to the physical space itself. And I did a lot of paintings from the studio window, looking out at the landscape and the shadow of the house on the land, which really relates to what I'm doing now. Ever since I left New York, I've been really dedicated to landscape painting, specifically plein air painting, totally perceptual out in the land, um, especially out west now where I live. In oil, right? Oil paint. Yeah, oil paint. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Tanya. Hi. Uh, my name is Tanya Alvarez. I'm currently living in Germantown, New York. Um, when I was accepted into the um, James Castle House residency, I was um, just leaving New York City um, to move up here. So it was a big shift um, of landscape for me 
just coming upstate and then going to Boise, which was um, a, another huge shift for me. And it was like right after COVID. Um, so it was um, really interesting to have um, all of those new environments to interpret through my work. And when I was at the Castle House, I was um, really focusing on the interiors and patterns that I saw at the Castle House or in Boise in general. And I was trying to um, create dreamscapes where I combined uh, both what I was seeing in Boise with um, some of the architecture and interior spaces from my home. Um, and um, since leaving the Castle House, um, I, I am still working with interior spaces um, and memory. Um, I use a lot of references from my home and uh, landscape here in Germantown. Um, and uh, I was also focusing on textile works at the Castle House, which was something I kind of got away from for a long time and being around um, Castle's work um, kind of inspired me to get back into working with sewing and textile. And I'm working with that still today. Yeah. And the paintings that you were doing were also oil, correct? Or was it acrylic? Um, it was mixed media. It was um, oil, acrylic, um, graphite. And then there was a lot of like sewing happening and collage. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. And Gerard. Oh, I think you were... Even though you are saying that your mic is off, I cannot hear you. No, I can't. I wonder if... Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Definitely. I'm Gerard, I'm a poet. Um, I was at the James Castle House spring, well, winter. It's January, April 21. Um, I was working on a series of palindromes that eventually rounded out my first collection of poems, Muscadon. Uh, these palindromes, I think, um, definitely mealed the language of the people um, from where I'm from in Northwest Mississippi in the Delta. Um, uh, some of it was thrifted language from blues songs some of it was language from elders, uncles, aunts, um, people who are largely responsible for my own uh, sort of acquisition of language. Um, and yeah, that's what I was working on at the council house. Yeah, thank you. Um, the palindromes, for people who don't know, could you tell us what that is? So, so a palindrome, uh, in essence, is a word that is spelled the same forward as it is back spell the same backward as it is forward. And a palindrome poem is a poem whose lines read the same backwards as they do forward. I'm going to buy that book. I want to see that. Mm -hmm. sure, tell me where I can order it. Fourwaybooks.com. Yeah, got it. All right. So because I got to sit down with each of these artists, I have an idea how they would answer this. The question is about processing the world and your creative um, intentions internally versus externally, whether that is um, an emotional space or other kind of space. So who wants to open that up? I can dive in. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the internal, I think one thing that I especially learned from James Castle is responding to your sort of daily life, which is something I've always done. I always tend to paint what's around me and my life as it unfolds. And I think it's a way of processing my own life and sort of recording my own existence. And that has led me to even more direct version of that now, which is purely working from perception. So I'm completely looking outside myself and recording the world around me instead of sort of a step removed and interpreting it. Um, and what I see Castle is doing is through that recollection and recording, he's sort of elevating the mundane, the everyday, whatever's around him into something really poetic, something kind of extraordinary. Um, so I 
through being at the James Cowles house, learned a lot through about his work and that that is enough. You can kind of, it's a really pure to me and really genuine way of working just by processing the world around me and saying that that is enough to create a powerful image and a, and a universal image in a way as well. And then sort of externally, just how the, the paintings physically form, um, which is also something that I relate to James Castle is this building with positive and negative space. So there's sort of this equality of surface, both visually and then also in the literal landscape of the, the work, um, the marks all sort of click together. His work, everything has a weight to it. There's not a behind a backdrop that something is given as lesser importance. It's all given that weight. Um, and when I'm painting, I like to think about that too, or I'm sort of piecing color together. So it has a physical presence, but I'm also not, there's no hierarchy of importance. You know, the sky or the backdrop, the background is just as present in the image um, that you see as well as on the surface of the painting. Um, and that's something else that I think I learned a lot from James Castle. What's behind and in between is just as important as sort of what's in front. And that also connects again to the, just the concept of everything around us is so charged. There's so much there. We tend to look at the thing in the front though, huh? Yeah, exactly. And I had a teacher who said he didn't like the word background because it already says that that's lesser. It's already giving it a value judgment. And why does it have to be that way? And the way I see James, James Castle doing that is he creates actual shapes of what would be the background. So it has this like physical pressure of form, even if it's sky or space between, it's given as much importance and pressure in the image. Or weight, even like, a, it, you know, exactly as a visual weight. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts? So, um, Gerard, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to gonna do a callback to what we talked about in the pre-interview, which was when I asked about, I put it in a different phrasing. I talked about introversion or extroversion. And you said, do you remember what you said? I said I was deeply introverted, I believe, which was the yeah. truth. <laughs> right. And I think it was deep introversion. So I wondered if you could talk about how you might use your creative practice while being deeply introverted. Well, I think, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like it lends itself to being a poet um, or, or being a person who writes in solitude or, or needs quiet or privileges quiet when, when they're writing. Um, and, you know, that's exactly what the council house is going to offer you if you're there as a writer. Um, it's going to be quiet, um, but you know, I get to I get to mumble out loud. I get to you know hear the language clearly in a different context. But I think that allows for a, a greater degree of accuracy in, in in my ambitions to uplift and shine a light on the level of language that I'm working with, uh, the language of the folks that, that, that I claim to be um, praising and honoring. Um, yeah, so, it, so it, 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 I feel like it just naturally lends itself to, to that kind of work. I feel like you're in the right, right place. Yeah. And I don't mean the James Castle House, but as a poet, it, it feels fitting. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that leads us right into my surprise question, which is, is you guys don't know this, but I'm going to ask you to take a second and close your eyes. Just relax. I know it can be intimidating, but I want you to imagine yourself back in the studio at the James Castle House and imagine where you're sitting and what's outside what the temperature is and remember the food and remember we talked a lot about food so now if you could come back to this here what was the weather my weather everybody's yeah i think it was all quite similar it was pretty like chilly and not like super cold but it felt like a a fall here for me when I was there. Yeah, I was it, felt, 
Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Nope. Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say it was cold as well, but very cold, snowy. Um, I remember painting through the window as it was snowing. Um, so, yeah. I thought it was going to be colder than it was. <laughs> Not that it wasn't cold. It was definitely cold um, and kind of windy. I was happy to see the snow because I expected so much snow. And so the little <laughs> snow that we did get, I was thrilled to see it. I was thrilled to shovel it the first couple of days. Um, but it was over pretty quickly. And with the cold weather comes certain kinds of foods. And I heard stories of food showing up at the studio. Oh, that was my favorite part. I had um, some neighbors like bake bread and I had fresh jam and I had the most lovely person bake me cookies. Um, I think it was like weekly and I loved it. I was like, no, no, stop. <laughs> but they were so delicious. Um, yeah, it, or it was often and I it was really I felt very spoiled. Um, so, yeah, that was a, a definite perk. Yeah, it felt like the house had like a little guardian angels or something. Oh, okay. Like in what way? In the way that food showed up unexpectedly and it was yummy and warm and you know, people looking after you without knowing who they are sometimes. That, I get that. After years in New York, it was a wonderful surprise how warm a community can be. Um, I think when you move to Brooklyn, no one is that excited that you're there. You know, there's a million pictures in Brooklyn. You're not special, but entering Boise, this new place, I felt so welcome. People wanted to meet me. They were happy that I was there. And it was sort of my first taste of what it's like to be an artist outside of New York. And it clearly left an impression on me because I have since left New York and live in a small town now. Um, and that, that warmth of community was something that really, you know, resonated then and it's something what about, I love about my life now. Yeah. And I'm telling you, I'm going to pick on you because you specifically talked about in New York, going from your home or whatever to the studio that just the walk could really flavor what you ended up doing in the studio. Could you expand on that? Oh yeah. I mean, anything can happen from your commute, like walking to the train or like in the train, someone's like yelling at you or, you know, you like almost step in something and you're like carrying like 20 pounds on each shoulder. And by the time you get to the studio, you're like, wait, where is my head? What, it, what am I trying to do today? And sometimes you'd be so emotionally spent that like you wouldn't be as productive or you'd have a hard time kind of like getting in the zone where like where I am now I feel like like it's the total opposite like I have a very like peaceful drive with like mountain landscapes everywhere and then by the time I get there I'm like on the river where my studio is and you know it like totally puts you in the zone rather than like kind of throwing you all over the place where I felt like I was constantly battling in the city just like finding my center um so it's nice kind of not struggling with that as much. Yeah, yeah, that's something that can easily be taken for granted when you don't have those energy, you know, those energies cutting it all over your aura. <laughs> yeah. Better words. I love to watch the ASL interpreter do this. Okay, <laughs> thank you, I love it. Um, okay, so then that brings us to home. You, all three of you, I feel have a lot to say about what home means to you. And you, and I, whoever wants to start. I'll start. Okay. Um, so home for me has always symbolized, has always been like a symbol for myself. Um, it's a place where I store my memories and um, even, you know, whether it's childhood memories, um, you know, where I dream of the future. Um, and so I've constantly returned to it. And I think that, you know, it's, it's also in, I, I hope that it's an easy jump off point for people to connect to the work, whether it be, you know, finding their own memories through looking at mine or, 
um, you know, what have it. And yeah, now I lost my train of thought. So someone else. Well, can <laughs> you did make a big change though from New York and you called it a, did you call it a zoom boom town or something like that? Was that somebody else? It's like a town, remember. like when every, during the COVID, when people left cities and moved out to the country and it became a Zoom boom, I think. Or Zoom oh, boom. there was like a real estate boom up here. Um, so I got here before it like went crazy, thankfully. Um, but yeah, shortly after the real estate market had like blown up over here and it was impossible to find anything. So we felt really fortunate that we came up when we did. Um, and it was like, I was really hesitant to come up here um, just to, because I had been in the city so long and I kind of defined myself by being in the city. Um, and then by moving up here, I think it was the best thing for me and for the work. I think it nurtured um, a part of me that I, I didn't know I had living in the city. Um, and like rebuilding the house that we have. It's like a 1950s farmhouse. So it's constantly has a problem. Um, so it's informed a lot of the spaces um, that you see in my work now and even at the castle house. Right, and I think you said this was the first time owning a home or purchasing a home. Yeah, it's the first time for both of us. Um, so it's been a really um, amazing thing to do together. Right. And so I remember you building structures and painting the layout because you were sort of so excited to get back to the old farmhouse. Yeah, it, it was a really interesting time to like leave for so long because we were in the middle of so many projects here. Um, so, yeah, it was it was both it, it just made it more exciting to come back and to kind of like have that space at the castle house to kind of um, create those dreamscapes and try to remember. Yeah, dreamscapes is another kind of home. It's a home for something else besides our physical body. Um, more thoughts on home. I mean, other than home being a place which, I don't know, I feel like my work springs from, I feel like home is also it, it has a sound. It has a it has a it has a feel like an energy that can be transported to other places that you can take with you. Um, and so, the, I think I think in recent years, my ideas of of what home is has been expanded in those ways. In that, I'm never. I'm never detached from home, even though I may not be in the county where my home is or the place where I'm calling home is. Um, but that the language can go across state lines, um, that these things are, are not stationary to a place, even though they're born out of a place. Um, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me that you're speaking specifically about language and words and Tanya was drawing the uh, floor diagram. Well, and then for you to be displaced in the residency into James Castle's literal home and look out where his window was, did you have some insight into looking at his work in the archive and the theme of home in his work? I mean, definitely, definitely because of um, Castle's this relationship with language. Um, there were things in his work, um, his alphabets, his language systems um, that were completely his. Uh, it was definitely inspiring in, in the palindromes and the language that I was trying to mine that was from a specific place that. Um, dealt with or wanted to portray a specific voice, a specific kind of voice. Um, and, you know, and these are just things that everyday, everyday language, uh, not the flowery, sophisticated, um, 
elevated language that, that we really see in, in, in poetry a lot of times. And so, I don't know, it became, I felt charged by seeing him work from his relationship with language and the work that he made with, with words and letters. Um, it, it, it kind of charged me in that way. So. That's kind of exciting. What does it feel like to be charged? Uh, just inspired. It feels like you have energy to do what you want to do. You feel the kind of permission you are giving. Um, yeah. That I've heard a lot of artists talk about observing James Castle's work and it giving them permission to do what they really wanted to do, whether it was repetition or like you described, um, kind of a utilitarian language versus that elevated po poetic language, right? Right. It kind of made me wonder about how we think of home as a space. James Castle created a space for himself through his creative practice that because it was not a, like the English language or the uni you know, not universal, but it was his own language, that it was a very sort of private Space. Right. Uh, it did. It did elicit uh, a, a great sense of intimacy. Yes, but we. I don't know it, how much his intention was that it be private, or versus it being a barrier. Right. Being, yeah. There. There being a barrier. Yeah. So, Rachel, you also went through a move from mm -hmm. New York to out way out west. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk about that change in um, your process from yeah. physical location? Um, yeah, it's been quite a change. And I think I really relate to everything Tanya said about sort of absorbing the chaos of the city. And I definitely had a hard time separating from that in the studio and kind of stripping it away and going back to just purely me. And what am I thinking and what do I want to paint? Even being the proximity of the art world, it's sort of all running through your head. So this move out west, um, this new physical landscape I've really fallen in love with, just even having this big open sky above me feels really good mentally. Having a really clear land sky relationship, it's something that East Coast doesn't quite have as much, even the woods, you know, are dense around you. So having that big sky above me feels like I can have a more open mind, kind of a more clear mind. And then I just have a much simpler life where I have more time for painting, more physical and mental energy for painting. Um, and so how that relates to home too, just like Tanya, I'm in my first home that we purchased, um, just something that was not possible in New York, but became possible when we left. And so I have this attachment to my, my physical world in kind of a new way. And I think home for me is always a, a sense of both intimacy of space, but also a feeling of belonging. And in my past work, I have kind of obsessively painted my physical spaces, I think in an attempt to claim some sort of ownership over things that were only temporarily mine, whether it's a rental or being at a residency and knowing I'm only here for a couple months, I'm sort of obsessed with capturing it and holding it and claiming it. Um, and what's funny is now that I have a home that really feels like mine, I think having control over your space is part of what makes it feel like a home to me. Um, I haven't painted my space at all. And instead, what I'm kind of trying to claim, I think is a bigger thing about this Western landscape, which isn't a part of my history. I don't have family out here. We're, you know, the pioneer history is not my history. And I'm sort of inserting myself into that and attempting to claim my place in the West through painting it. So I am outside in the land, trying to get that big guy above me, that feeling of openness. Um, so it's shifted quite a bit, but I think because I finally feel really comfortable in my space, knowing it's mine, I don't feel so desperate to paint it. Whereas out there is so unknown and mysterious and wild to me that that's where my head is at trying to paint and sort of claim. You know, I found it really interesting the, the two types of attitudes you had toward talking about interiors and the desperation versus when you talk about painting the landscape, it was not, a, you may have been still wanting to claim it as part of yourself. Mm -hmm. You talked about the landscape, you didn't use the word desperation and you didn't have the stress in your face. 
but I wanted to claim it and you looked up. Like, yeah. Like, you feel a different thing, thing in here. You can totally. Yeah. It's a sense of wonder and awe and it's, it's untamable. I, you know, I live next to a, a national park that's bigger than the state of Rhode Island. I will never know it all. I'll never claim it all. And I don't feel that I need to. I just want to take a little slice of it home with me with my painting it. Um, having it be so much bigger than me feels really comforting. It's like, I feel small, but in a way that feels good. Whereas I think sometimes in the city and you're surrounded by all this, you, I felt small in a way that didn't feel good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I don't feel, you know, I, out painting outside, there's so much happening. It's so wild that you know you can't tame it. I just want to record this little moment in time. And then I come back to sort of the safe zone of my home, knowing I feel really safe and good here. Um, but yeah, definitely change. <laughs> yeah, I love tying the creative pro process and practice to the idea of trying to incorporate something into your own self. You, Tanya, Gerard, do you identify with that at all? With, with what, sorry? Well, with um, your, using your creative practice or making art to incorporate something to the self or reconcile it to the self or make a claim to it. Yeah, I think I, I'm constantly making a claim to like my space. And I, and I relate to what Rachel said in that, like there was this constant sense of impermanence, like whether it would be that you couldn't afford to stay there any longer or just like the things that you were allowed to do in your physical space that like now I, I, I just view, I view like my home and, and everything that I'm putting into it in, I don't know. It, it's just like completely different. And like, I'm even incorporating landscape, which I would have never done um, in the city. And I think it is that sense of like appreciation that you have for your life and the world that maybe you don't have the mental space for um, when you're in the middle of such chaos, um, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think some of some of how I interpreted it was laying claim to a comfort and safety. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think I think about laying claim to to language, um, to southern dialects, to to loss in the midst of um, the abundant things that we still have in spite of those losses. Um, I don't know, I feel like that's probably the most powerful claim that my work is trying to make. So you've got to help me, Gerald, because I want to hear it again, because every word you say has such importance that I need to hear it all again. You know what I mean? I said, I feel like the strongest claim my work wants to make is this claim to uh, language, a southern way of speaking, um, a place um, claim even to the loss that has occurred um, in the midst of so much abundance that we still have in spite of that loss. And so even though we're taking ales, we're also faced with an abundance of land and resources and, and senses of home and, and, and language that is regenerated and turned over and, um, I don't know, is unfolding uh, Continuous, limitless, yeah. I love that um, sort of putting the loss and the abundance on two sides of a coin that it, they exist simultaneously. Kind of what I heard. Yeah. So, as a native Idahoan myself, um, Rachel, you used the word woods which we don't really use that we just got a lot of sagebrush we do have some forests 
And I can hear in my ear, I can hear Gerard using the word woods. I feel like you talked about woods. Gerard, could you talk about the woods? I know you said something about home and woods, not in the pre-interview, but back when you were at the James Castle house. Do you remember that? Hunting? The woods. I mean, I go to the woods and, and write. I mean, I, I come up with a lot of the first lines of poems come to me when I'm walking. Um, whether I'm just on a morning walk or if I'm walking through the woods, um, it's a peaceful place. You can hear yourself clearly. Nobody's going to look at you suspiciously because you're mumbling to yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I feel safe out there. I feel connected to um, the earth. Um, and so it's an important part of my practice that way. Yeah. When, when you say it, I feel the sense um, of safety and home, like, but from the outside, I'm like, can I go there with you? Because <laughs> it's not mine, right? I can feel it through you, but I, it's, it's, I cannot claim that experience for myself. I mean, the foothills kind of feel like that. No, it's just, it's, it's exactly the way you said it. It's the language and it's the, like you talk about dialect that made it feel the word was loved. Did you guys hear that? Did you hear the word love in the word? No? Okay. Maybe a little. <laughs> a little bit? I felt it. <laughs> okay. I have another surprise question. Um, oh, but we have to talk about material. Let's see. What are we going to do? Let's do the surprise question, which can be thought of as relating to physical items or emotional or whatever, intellectual. Each person has to answer, are you more likely to hold on tightly or let go lightly? Anybody want to start? I think hold on tightly. Yeah. What do you hold on tightly to? I think everything. I'm very sentimental. Um, I have a hard time of, yeah, just like letting go of memories or feelings or silly things such as like um the tags on things I buy sometimes like I can't even take them off so I think I hold on really tightly to like an experience maybe I don't know yeah I want to cherish everything I'd say hold on tightly too um I hold on tightly to I have a coat of my father's that I'll never get rid of I have uh, my mom's work badge from the elementary school she worked at for 31 years. I've got uh, a lot of little things like that that I keep to keep me close to people that I've lost. Um, yeah, so hold on tightly for sure. Okay, I'm definitely let go lightly. <laughs> I love releasing, I think. Um, physical and then also just kind of emotional and mental things. I used to, and I tend to get really bogged down with anxiety and I used to be consumed with the idea of regret until I just told myself that is a useless emotion and I need to kind of let go of that sensation. Um, so even with my own work, like I'll make a painting that I love and my husband will say, no, don't sell this one. And I'm like, it's gone, it's going. We have to make room, both sort of physical and mental room for what's next. So I tend to be very unsentimental about objects and things. I have a very few small things, but beyond that, I think I said this in our, our uh, planning session, I have a folder of sentimental things. And that's really all I need. Just a folder in my file cabinet. Um, whereas my sister is the opposite of me and it's, she holds on to everything. Um, and it might be a reaction against family members. My grandparents were like that. They held on to everything that I just let go of it all probably too brutally, but definitely let go. <laughs> well, in, if you apply that idea to your creative practice, do you think your creative practice helps you let go of things or does it help you hold on to? I know for me, my creative practice helps me let go of things. It's like a clearing. Yeah, I think it helps me let go where I'm processing things, you know, on the surface of a painting. 
So it's sort of out of my mind, out of my body. And then the painting yeah. goes away. Yes. So it's gone. And now I do the next I, yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could have some of that. Cause I feel like I'm totally, like I even struggle like get, like when something sells, like giving the painting away. It's like, I feel like I'm like ripping it out. I'm like, I don't know. They're, they become like my little children or something. Right. Um, so I, I do become a little too sentimental, even with the object that I made for maybe someone else to have. <laughs> so yeah, I wish I could take some of that from you. <laughs> um, okay, um, so then Tony, we were going to talk about material because this is how it goes into holding on too tightly. Yeah, it's probably um, anyone can also respond to the experience of going to the archives and physically getting to touch James Castle's work and look at how it's constructed. Rachel, you also mentioned that you got to do that at a um, in a different institution before you even came out here. Mm -hmm. So you can talk about that. But we'll start with Tanya because you just talked about the tags, but I know you've got a lot more materials. Um, going on than tags. Yeah, I probably have like 15 years of like gift cards in a box. Like I, I have a problem. Like my partner really hates it. He's like, please just throw something out. I'm like, no. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I think going to the archive for me was like such a pivotal moment in my career because I've always struggled with like these two sides of my creative process. Um, because I was I was doing for probably since like 20 I think no I think it started in like 2017 I started making these um textile pieces alongside of my um paintings and I never really knew how to go about like having these two parts of myself and I kind of kept the textile work really private and uh when I had gone to the castle house um a few of the people who worked at the castle house were really pushing me to like investigate those works a bit more because they had seen it in my portfolio. And uh, when I had gone to the archives, I saw like the vast array of like material explorations and um, drawings. Yeah. And... For people who don't know the kinds of materials or assemblages, could you sort of give some examples? Of mine? Both, James Castle's that you saw Oh, okay. And your own, yeah. So the ones I saw of, of James Castle's were, um, I think a lot of them were using like old cardboards and food packaging. And the one that like really just like struck my core was like, it was like bound with this, uh, it was like the, the thick burlapy string. You know what I mean? And it That's was just funny. like, yeah, there was like this weight to it and it made me really emotional. And it's just like, you could feel the person who made it and also like the history maybe of, of his life through like the foods and uh, material that he used to like- Cause it was kind of packaging. Cause you could be like, okay, well then someone ate this obviously. Yeah, and I just really felt the man who made it and I, I was really touched by it and um, so I remember coming home that night and I just like couldn't sleep. I was, I just became obsessed with the idea of recreating my memory of my house through all of the food packaging I was eating at the castle house, which kind of embarrassingly was mostly Amy's pizza. Um, so I had pizza boxes. Yeah. So I had a lot of pizza boxes um, that I then began to um, sew together into these, um, sculptures. Um, and I thought it was just something I would do at the residency and I'm actually, um, continuing it, um, even now, like I was working on one today using like old fabrics from clothing and, um, packaging materials. Um, a lot of it I take from my partner's business where he has a lot of, um, he works with screen printing. So there's a lot of like garment waste and everything that I'll take and um, make work with. So yeah, it was, it was a really uh, special time that influenced my work. Well, yeah, one of the struggles um, of being an artist is 
will this assemblage be viewed as art? Because a painting on a canvas is so clearly and obviously art that can be exchanged for monetary value. Whereas if it is a, a material that's been recycled, will someone see the value in the creative process even though it's not oil painting canvas or even though it's not a published book, right? There's mm -hmm. some in using a non-art material, I think. Yeah, I think there was a lot of fear around that. Like, what is this as valuable as the paintings that I've worked my whole life to make? And like, did I see value in this as well? And I think that like going to the archive and seeing what he did really made me see the value in it that I guess I'd never saw prior to the residency. But yeah, um, that, that permission. Yeah, um, and it, it, it gave me a lot of freedom that I just didn't feel before. Um, which is really exciting and it's and it's funny now that we're talking about this because I just kind of switched gears again into that kind of work. Um, so yeah. Huh. Now, any other comments on the um, physical um, material life? Or I felt I felt like I felt like knowing how humble the materials he used. I remember flipping through some of the little. Um, the miniature books that were bound together and remembering how um, how well put together they felt, how sturdy they felt to be as old as they were and knowing how humble those materials are, I felt it, it I keep using this word charged, um, but it felt like, um, I don't know, it felt like a, a signal to to go ahead and, you know, if you see value in it, somebody else is going to see the value in it. Um, and so to be such humble materials, but to feel so premium, uh, the quality right. felt, mm. felt so premium, um, it, I don't know. It, 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 it's a, it, it was inspiring to see and to touch and to to be connected to in in such a real way. Right. When you were talking about language and everyday language versus poetic language, would you use the word humble for that everyday language as well? I mean, yeah. Similar. I mean, similarly to the humble materials that Castle House uses, the language that. I was milling or am milling in my work um, is language that most folks would call, um, I don't know, humble. Um, well, I was, I was thinking. Definitely uh, dialectal, um, everyday speech that, or even misspeak or words that are often mispronounced depending on where you're from. Uh, seeing that reflected in the canon, I think is an important um, ambition in my work. So. Yeah. yeah like oh, Rachel, did you want to talk about material? Yeah. Cool. I'm when I think when you when I was viewing his work at the archive, and then before I had the privilege to coordinate an exhibition of James Castle's work at the New York Studio School in 2018. Um, so I was familiarized with a lot of his work and objects for that exhibition. Is that you feel this tender attention? Um, that, yeah, it doesn't matter what the material was, that it doesn't have a sort of value on its own. He gave it that value and he cared about it just as much. And also, I, I think you feel this palpable sort of need to document and to communicate through the work. Um, and it's also such a great reminder, sort of against all odds, look how productive and brilliant someone was. Um, I think, you know, I've definitely felt like, oh, I need my studio, I need X, Y, and Z in order to make my work, right? And then James Castle teaches us that, no, you don't, you need yourself and sort of your intuition and your passion, and that's enough. And it was a great lesson for me all of last year. I was on the road and I didn't have a studio, and I thought, how am I going to paint? How am I going to do this? But it led me to making these intimately sized landscape paintings for a year, and it, which is kind of what I'm still working on now and so he shows us how sort of productive and ingenious he was um kind of against all odds which is an incredible lesson it is yeah without the formal aspects of what we would call an art career 
for a writing career. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I have um, one last question. It's for everyone, but I would like to start with Gerard and it's about, we're talking about using art to process life or loss. Gerard, could you talk about, um, we talked specifically about grief. Yeah, um, I mean, a lot of the, I mean, many of the poems in my first book, Muscadine, like elegies or um, poems that point to um, moments or experiences of grief, whether they're mine or whether they're family members I'm observing. Um, and so it's been important for me to use my practice or allow my practice to um, to deal with that material and, and those experiences, um, to process them for myself and for um, those who are grieving alongside me. Um, I don't know, I feel like there's a, I feel like there's a generosity in sharing um, experiences of grief and loss like that, uh, because a lot of other people are grieving and losing and, you know, sometimes we get in the way of other people's grieving process and, and we don't know it. Um, and, you know, we can't see it because of our own. Um, and so, you know, being able to allow one's full range of grief to manifest and materialize, I feel like is an important um, thing that, um, I don't know, my creative process wants to, wants to liberate in folks, you know? Yeah, that there's a couple things in the room to um, stand on. When I was talking about using your creative practice to hold on or let go, where does grief fall on that spectrum? Um, I mean, I think for the moment, I think I think for the for for the moment where the the work you use now is it's to I mean it's definitely to to let go of the grieving process because that ain't fun for nobody. I don't, I don't know nobody that had fun grieving. Um, and so it's definitely uh, in part to work through those emotions and those sort of stages of grief. Um, but I'm still holding on to those physical things that remind me that remind me of other people. Um, and if that means I'm still grieving, then I'm just going to be grieving. Uh, and I'm okay right. with it. Well, for all of you, have you experienced um, a work of art or writing or something from culture that allowed you to process grief in some way or identify with, like Radisson, to help liberate people from the grief process? I mean, I think art, one of the powerful things it can do is speak directly to someone. Like Tanya, you were saying, you hope it can speak to people about home because it's a universal theme and grief also being a universal theme. So I don't know if there's a question in there. Yeah, I think I think about painting as sort of memorial and whether that's in a literal way, like I painted a portrait of my grandfather as a present for my mother. Um, which was a memorial to him and a way to remember him and a way for me to process sort of the loss of him, but also almost pre-loss, recording things before they're gone. Yes. And holding on to them, knowing that that memory will fade or even painting the land, knowing it will change. Thinking like where I live, Joshua trees are endangered because of climate change and I'm painting them obsessively. Why? Maybe I'm holding on to something for history. I don't know. So I think it can be before you lose something, a way to document and hold on to its memory, you know, in preparation for the loss. Yeah, that's hard. Hard, but important. Any other comments? Okay, well, with that we're gonna open up to the Q&A. So I think I'm in charge of that. Okay, 
Like that. Questions from anonymous attendees. From what you call, from what you recall of your residency, what surprised or challenged you during your stay? Things you explored in your work, people you met in Boise, or people you met, or Boise itself? Surprises. I was surprised hmm. how social it was. You know, they, there's a lot of preparation about being there alone, but what I wasn't expecting was how the community sort of you become a part of it, whereas you might not be in a residency with a lot of other artists. Um, the local artist community is sort of like, you're one of us now. Um, so that was a great surprise. Um, and then I think also personally, I was very surprised by my response to landscape, which I had never really been around landscape living in the city so I had never really painted it and then that was my first time painting it because it was suddenly right in front of me right which, out the door exactly and which is so related to what I'm doing now so that seed definitely was planted four years ago when I was in Boise yeah I had someone tell me once that I was photographing skies because I could and that yeah. if I lived in the east I wouldn't be doing that mm -hmm. and I so, since then I was like oh Okay, I got a, I have a sky to paint. I don't paint, I do photography. Anyway. <laughs> um, other responses to things that surprised you during your stay? Or challenge, there's also challenge, like challenges in that question. I think Boise really surprised me. I, I just like wasn't expecting it to be um, nearly as cool as it was, like not to make it, I don't know. I just like wasn't expecting what I, what I what it was like it was really cool and the city was just really cute and had a lot to offer and the food was really great and the people were so kind and I think that you know I I, I don't know it just gave me hope that like there there is like life outside of the city which sounds so crazy but I think you get really like tunnel visioned about New York as you live there and um and I think I surprised myself that you know, I, I think I was scared to be alone for so long. And um, I think it was like the best thing I could have ever done for myself. Um, so, yeah. Okay, I just have to point out that Tanya comes from a family who owns or owned a restaurant. So to say that the food here is acceptable, it means a lot to me, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Taking personal responsibility for this. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if anything surprised me. Um, I did, I did kind of feel challenged by toward the end, the amount of alone time I had. Coming um, from the deep introvert. Yeah, you know, I mean, sometimes it gets stale. <laughs> I mean, I have feelings. <laughs> 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 um, but I, I don't know. It did feel good that, that there were communities, there were people uh, that, that shared enough of the same interests as me that I could sort of gather around. And, and I think that um, I think that was a good that was a good placeholder for, for what I felt like I lacked. So, yeah, no surprises, but. Other challenge and overcome yeah. the challenge. Got a little too quiet. It can be really quiet. Yeah. Um, any other challenges? I have another surprise question, which is during your stay, if you could have teleported something from home, what would it be? Hmm. I mean, probably my husband, but he did come and visit me. So I sort of did teleport him because it's a long time to be away from your your family. Okay, so that goes, um, Denise asks, what length of time is each residency? And correct me if I'm wrong, but they're all about three months. Yes, yeah. So Two. three months, that's a long time. It is, but it was incredible having that much time because you can really build like one thing leads to another, leads to another. I feel like a month long residency, the last week is where the magic happens. 
and you're sort of desperate because then you have to go. And this allows you to have like multiple waves and multiple bodies of work. So I loved the amount of time, but um, of course it is hard to be away from loved ones that long. And the dog. Because no. <laughs> I could see the dog park outside of the residency window and I was like, oh, I miss my dog. Tanya, if you could teleport your dog, I would so do that. I know, I wanted to teleport my dog. I would have teleported a dog too. Right? Like any dog. Uh, I have another question from the Q&A. Is there anything left unfinished from your time in residency? Anything you wish you could explore further if you return to Boise in the future? Yes. I mean, I just was talking to Kristen about that actually before we dove in. I feel like now that I'm fully kind of committed to landscape, I want to come back and see what that's like. Where I was I barely landscape painting. I was only doing it through the window, right? I was I still- I gotta tell on you. Rachel painted the shower a lot, the bath and the floor. I did. A lot of walls. I Yes, I was still very interior. I was looking yes. out, but I was still inside. And I want to know what it's like to go back and actually really mo engage more with the land and the exterior of the building. Yes. Uh, so I do feel like I have unfinished business and I'd love yes. to go back. <laughs> I don't feel like I have anything left unfinished. I feel like I'm still, I feel like I'm still working in that mode that I was working in. Um, but what I completed there, I feel like it's finished. Um, but because it's in the book and the book is out, um, but I'm still, I'm still sort of on this kick of sound and sonics. And yeah, sound, but. So do you feel like you I have to do two part question. No, the first part doesn't even matter. Okay. The question is, did you find why palindromes? Because of the echo like quality that they offer. The reverberation of those sounds. Like nothing, no other form does that but the palindrome. Yeah. I have to spend some time making sounds and to do what you're describing. You know, you talked a lot about hearing your own voice in the woods, hearing your own voice in the quiet stillness of the James Castle house. I don't have enough of that in my life. It's very, it's almost like um, a mindful experience, right? Yeah. Yeah, mindfulness on the sound of your own voice. How uncomfortable would that be? How uncomfortable is listening to my own voice? I feel that for me to listen, I think that it initially there's, right, not you personally, but when you hear your own voice, you feel like super cringy. Oh, when, when I hear my own recorded voice, absolutely. Right. Yeah. But if I'm just talking and it's just me and I'm listening, it's fine. Like I'm, okay. I'm working, it's, I'm chiseling, I'm, I'm refining you know, it's part of the process you know it might almost be like to a painter what it might be like to make a self-portrait not necessarily a painter but a visual artist versus poet like you. or really any painting because those you know voice can also be marks it can be words it can be a lot of things and so sometimes it is hard to look at your own work I mean, for me at least because i you know you're like i did that there's no one to blame but me that's that is me you know, and, and that can be uncomfortable. Thank you for putting into words my feelings. <laughs> okay, I just have one question to wrap it up and that is what advice would you give an artist who wants to apply for this residency and or to broaden it, any residency? Oh. I would say have a very open mind with your work. Um, maybe don't come with expectations of yourself and what you'll make to allow you to surprise yourself and respond to things you weren't expecting. I say, I say, I say come with, with, with an obsession. Um, not really an expectation around it, an obsession, but something that you just can't get off of. 
you you're stuck on and maybe can't figure out, but are obsessed with, with working through it because um, a space like the Castle House, I feel like is prime for that. Problem solving space. Um, what about practical tips for applying for residencies? I think the most important thing is to really um, not just like apply to like any and every residency. Like I know for like maybe like right after leaving um, my MFA program, I thought that that was the way to go. Um, but th the more I learned about myself and like what I needed, I think it's best to just applied like less is more really find something that can um benefit you and your practice in the long term and like find stuff that makes sense for your kind of work um because not every residency is suited for you and and your type of work um so i think that was the best advice that i ever got just like slow down mm -hmm. really focus on making the work strong and then figure out what you need and where would where? benefit you. Where? Um, where? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, other practical tips. Um, I think, I think having a sense of your artistic trajectory is, is, a, is a good thing to be able to articulate in an application. Um, knowing where you started, where you are, where you want to be, where you want to go. I think those are things that people who read these applications want to know that you have a good sense of. Um, I would agree with that. Yeah, have a clear kind of vision and voice in the body of work that you're submitting um, and sort of with ideas of where you want to take it while being open to the while being very open to the spontaneity that can happen once you get there mm -hmm. all right well everybody thank you so much for being here i love this i love how present you were and you just um went for every ride that i got you in line for thank you and to everyone who attended tonight thank you and we have another one february 8th again at 6 p.m mountain time Three different artists from these three, Nat Mead, Antonius Tindy, and Emily Culver, who have a totally different vibe than this group. So it'll be completely different in another good way. They're all good ways and very exciting. So everybody, thank you and good night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.